I want to speak a message to you today that I've entitled, Is Anyone Else Hungry? Is Anyone Else Hungry? If I could have you open your Bibles, please, to Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, and we're going to start in verse 18. And the scriptures read this way. John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. And they came and they said to him, Why did John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples don't fast? Jesus said to them, While the bridegroom is with them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot fast, can they? So long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then in that day they will fast. Many years ago, I had an opportunity to go on a vacation to Australia. The flight was going to be approximately 30 hours, and I had never flown on a plane before. Now, I wasn't the least bit scared, not the least bit nervous to fly, but what nobody told me was that when you begin to ascend and and go up in altitude, your head begins to fill with pressure and it feels like it's going to pop off your shoulders. And so sure enough, the plane takes off and it starts up into the clouds and my head begins to absolutely want to explode. I am instantly begin to feel nauseous and I turn pale. I was so pale, I looked like I stepped out of the coffin and onto the plane. The flight attendant said, I wonder how many hours we're flying. And I'd say, three hours, ah, 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 four hours, ah, ah, ah. That was Sesame Street. Remember the count from Sesame Street? Just like that. That was funny in my mind. I thought that was actually going to be pretty funny. So anyway, this, continuing on, this uh, flight attendant, she was trying to make me feel comfortable. She was trying everything she could because she could see how torturous this was for me. She was trying to feed me crackers and she was trying to give me juice. But I knew whatever went into my body was going to come right back out. And so I knew I couldn't eat anything. So for 30 straight hours, it was absolute torture. For 30 hours, I never had one bite to eat and I was feeling it. But you know, I think if we're all honest... When the topic of fasting comes up in the church, this is what pops into our mind, right? We think, are you kidding me? A whole day without food? It's like trying to drag yourself through a desert. I am sure I will die. I'm going to fade away to nothing. Do you know what you're asking me to do? It's torturous. Oh, the humanity. But is it possible that the reason that we have this adverse feeling toward fasting in the church is because, honestly, we have forgotten how important this principle is in the Christian faith. See, I think if we're honest, lots of us will be reading through the Bible and we'll see where the nation of Israel fasted or or the disciples or Jesus himself, and we just kind of skim over it like it's not really there. And hope and we pray that this week is not going to be the week that the pastor calls a fast. Because if he does, how can I go on? But the truth is, is that I think the reason that we have this sort of feeling toward fasting and the reason we don't even think about fasting is because we're never taught about it. When was the last time you heard someone teach on the topic of fasting in church? Well, luckily for you today, you've arrived and we're going to learn just that. Today, I want to talk to you about fasting. And I'm going to answer the two most important questions anybody could ask about fasting. What is fasting and why do we fast? Simple as that. What is fasting and why do we fast? But before we can get there, there's something we must understand. Do you realize that Jesus expects us to fast? Do you realize that? In Mark chapter 2, verse 20, it says, But someday the groom will be taken away from them, and then they will fast. See, what's happening here is that the Pharisees have come to challenge Jesus. This has become quite commonplace in the Gospels. We see it all the time. But this time something's different. In this text, 
I don't know if you noticed when I read through this, but it said that John's disciples were there as well. So now you have John's disciples and you have the Pharisees' disciples standing before Jesus and somebody, we don't know who, cries out to Jesus and says, Jesus, I got a question for you. The Pharisees and their disciples, they fast. John and his disciples, they fast, but your disciples don't. Why don't your disciples fast? So Jesus, he, he uses this incredible illustration. He uses this illustration of a bridegroom. And he says, when the bridegroom comes, the attendants don't fast, do they? Well, see, in that custom, when the bridegroom would arrive and the, and the attendants were there, it was a time of great celebration. It was a time of great joy and excitement. It was a great big old party. It was a lot of fun, a great big feast. But he says, but when the bridegroom leaves, when I leave, he says, then my disciples will fast. See, when I was young, just a child, I learned the difference between a command and a request or a suggestion. My mom and dad, they would come up to me and they'd say, Drew, would you mind cleaning your room today? I knew at that point it was still a suggestion, so I could try to procrastinate a little bit. Maybe if I was lucky, I could get away with not doing it at all. But later in that day, my parents would come and they would say, Drew, you will clean your room, right? We've all seen that. Hand on the hip. You will clean your room, right? See, I recognized in that moment that it had just gone from a request to a command, See, in scriptures, we have no problem accepting commands from God. We have no problem accepting that we are commanded not to murder, not to steal, not to commit adultery, not to serve other gods or idolatry. We have no problem accepting that as a command. Yet when we read Jesus' words, when he tells us that his disciples will fast, we have over the years come to accept that, well, this is just a suggestion from God. This is just a request that we would, we would maybe fast. But the truth is that Jesus himself said that his disciples would fast. He said, when I am gone, my disciples will fast. In fact, in Acts 13, starting in verse 2, it says, One day as these men's were, men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Dedicate Barnabas and Saul for the special work to which I have called them. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. This is what I want you to notice about this verse. These early first generation of believers still felt that it was an important part of their spiritual walk to continue to fast. In this one verse, we saw twice where the author of Acts explains that they were fasting. He says they were fasting, and then they hear the voice of God, and then what did they do? They continued to fast. Fasting was an important part of the Christian life of the early believers. Is it possible that if these first early believers, this first generation of believers felt that fasting was so important to do that maybe we should as well? Maybe we're missing out on this incredible spiritual blessing by ignoring the whole principle of fasting. Could it be? See, Jesus said, my disciples will fast. What we see is the early church were actually fasting. They followed this command. So why don't we do it today? Why don't we do it today? Could it be that we just don't know what it is? There's hardly any teaching, so could it be that we don't really know what it is? Well, this is the first question I'm going to answer today. What is fasting? Well, David said in Psalm 109, verse 24... That my knees are weak from fasting, and I am skin and bones. Now, there are two elements to fasting. There is the physical element, and there is the spiritual element. So the physical element of fasting is simply this. You deny your body food. David said, 
I am weak at the knees from fasting and I am fading away to skin and bones. I'm going to put this out here. You are not going to fade away to skin and bones if you fast Netflix. Not going to happen. See, there, here's the thing about fasting. We know it's food and this is why we know it's food. Because food is a necessity of our body. Our body has to have food to survive. So when our body does not have food, it begins to crave. It begins to desire. Everything in us thinks about nothing but trying to grab a tuna sandwich on the cupboard. It is, it is, that is, Easton Bible Dictionary said this. Sacrifice, or sorry, fasting is the sacrifice of the human will which gives fasting all its value. Let me read that again, just in case you missed it. Fasting is the sacrifice of the personal will, which gives fasting all its value. See, fasting physically is denying ourselves food. It is denying the most basic thing that our body needs, craves, and desires. It is the denying of our will, the denying of our flesh. But when coupled with prayer, it becomes something far more. See, when we couple it with prayer, we are making a declaration to God that I am willing to put my desires aside. I am willing to put my will aside, my cravings aside. I'm willing to put myself aside to seek your will. This brings us to the second element of fasting, the spiritual element. See, the spiritual element of fasting is simply this. It's humbling yourself before God. This is what fasting in a spiritual sense is. It is humbling yourself before God, putting His will ahead of yours. There's another word for humbling yourself before God. It's worship. Fasting is a form of worship. In fact, in Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 36, it says, Anna, a prophet, was also there in the temple. She was the daughter of Phineal from the tribe of Asher, and she was very old. Her husband died when she had only been married for seven years. Then she lived as a widow to the age of 84 years old. She never left the temple, but she stayed there night and day, worshiping God with fasting and prayer. So see, Anna was a prophet. She spent her whole life, day in and day out, standing in the temple, worshiping God. And it says that she was worshiping God with fasting and prayer. But this isn't the only person we see coming to God and humbling themselves before the Lord. We actually see Daniel do it. In Daniel 9 verse 3 it says, So I turned to the Lord God and I pleaded with Him in prayer and fasting. I also wore rough burlap and I sprinkled myself with ashes. Fasting is simply this. We are denying our will to seek the will of God. We are putting His will ahead of ours. When we couple it with prayer, it becomes a form of worship. When we are worshiping by fasting, we are humbling ourselves before God. And this is what Daniel did. This is what they were doing in the Old and the New Testament when they were fasting. They were humbling themselves physically, spiritually before God to seek His voice. Let me ask you. When was the last time that you truly humbled yourself before God? When was the last time that you seriously took action like this and said that you would fight against your own desires, against your own will to seek the will of God? So you might not be aware of this, but the early church fasted two days a week. In other words, the early church made it a common practice to deny their flesh and seek the will of God. Do you realize that? That was a common practice with the early church. So this leads us to the second important question. Why do we fast? What's the point of it? Why do we do it? Matthew 6, starting in verse 16 says, And when you fast... See that commandment there again? There's that commandment. 
When you fast, don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do. For they try to look miserable and disheveled so people will admire them for their fasting. I tell you the truth, that is the only reward they will ever get. But when you fast, there's that command again. But when you fast, comb your hair and wash your face. Probably a good practice to do even when you're not fasting. Then no one will make notice what, that you're fasting except your father. Who knows what you do in private? And your father, who sees everything, will reward you. See, in Matthew 6, Jesus gives this fairly lengthy teaching on doing things for the approval of God and not for the approval of man. He says earlier, he says, when you pray, don't go out in the streets and pray in such a way that everyone's eyes are on you. So that everyone thinks that you're so spiritual, that you're so amazing, that you get exalted and and you get all the glory for your prayer. He says, when you give, don't go and give and make a great big scene of giving so that everybody sees what you're giving and how much you're giving so that everyone will think how spiritual and how amazing you are. Don't give in such a way that people begin to glorify you and, and lift your name up. And then he says, when you fast, don't fast in such a way that you look like you've drug yourself out of a coffin like Count Dracula. Don't don't look like like you're about to die and you're about to go six feet under so that everyone will look at you and say, look, look how how much torment this is causing him. But oh, how spiritual he is. He's still doing it for God. How, How wonderful that man is. No, he says you don't do that. He says you are supposed to be doing things to bring glory to Jesus and not yourself. Little side note, I want you to notice something here. Jesus says when you pray, when you give. We have no problem in the church accepting that Jesus Christ expects us to give and he expects us to pray. But grouped in this same group is when you fast. Jesus himself grouped these together. He gave them equal importance. So what he was saying, when you read through that chapter, you're going to read down through there, and what you're going to see is after each subject matter, and at the very end of his little discussion, he sums it all up by saying this. He says that when you fast with the right motive, you'll be rewarded. When you pray with the right motive you will be rewarded. When you give with the right motive, you will be rewarded. He's saying there is a reward for doing things with the right motive. And so he says in here, fasting. If you fast with the right motive, there will be a reward. So why do we fast? Well, Fasting is a form of worship. It's a form of humbling ourselves before the Lord. This is why we fast. We fast to worship. But don't be be mistaken. God promises that there is a reward to fasting with the right motive. And in fact, in the book of Ezra, we see that reward. In Ezra 8, starting in verse 21, it says, And there by the Ahava Canal, I gave orders for all of us to fast and to humble ourselves before our God. We prayed that he would give us a safe journey and protect us, our children, and our goods as we traveled. You jump to verse 23 and it says this, So we fasted and we earnestly prayed that our God would take care of us and he heard our prayer. You see that? Here Ezra is leading the exiles back into Jerusalem and he says he calls a fast for all of those who are traveling. Every last one of them he says we are going to fast and we are going to pray that God will protect us, that he will keep us safe and the Bible says that because of that fasting, humbling themselves before the Lord, it says God heard their prayer. God responded. Remember when we were talking about Acts chapter 3 earlier? That first generation of believers? The Bible says that they were fasting and they were worshiping the Lord. And then what happened? 
They heard the voice of the Holy Spirit speak to them. And then what did they do? After they hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, they continue to fast even more. Both places teach us that there is the greatest reward we could ever receive from fasting. And it's this. We will hear the voice of God clearer. In fact, when you begin to look through scriptures and you look where there was a fast called for the nation or there was a fast from a single person or a group of people, what you will begin to see is that as they begin to fast, God began to move in mighty ways. They begin to hear the voice of God. They begin to see God move. See, God would move mighty ways in their midst and they began to hear their voice clearer. See, I believe that the time has come that the church starts to make fasting an important part of the Christian faith once again. We must do it. The time has come that we must make it a common practice to deny our will and seek the will of God. The time has come to regularly humble ourselves before God, humble our will, humble our flesh, and seek the voice of God in His direction. The time has come to seek the voice of God earnestly. Those in the early church and even the nation of Israel before them, when they needed to hear God's direction, when they needed to hear the voice of God, they called a fast and God responded. I'm going to conclude here. Isaiah 58, starting in verse 1, says, Shout with the voice of a trumpet blast. Shout aloud and don't be timid. Tell my people Israel of their sins, yet they act so pious. They come to the temple every day and they seem delighted to learn all about me. They act like a righteous nation that would never abandon the laws of its God. They ask me to take action on their behalf, pretending that they want to be near me. We have fasted before you, they say. Why aren't you impressed? We have been very hard on ourselves and you don't even notice it. I will tell you why I respond. It's because you are fasting to please yourselves. I want to read that again. I want to read that. Take note of this. It's because you are fasting to please yourselves. Even while you fast, you keep oppressing your workers. What good is fasting when you keep on fighting and quarreling? This kind of fasting will never get you anywhere with me. Fasting and prayer is not about trying to strong arm God into doing what we want him to do. Fasting and prayer is completely about denying our flesh. It's denying our basic wants, our basic needs. It's fighting against our flesh to deny it, to say, I will seek the voice of God. I will seek His will. That is what fasting is all about. Fasting is making a declaration before God that you are willing to put your desires aside And seek His. See, I believe that God has gathered us here at Gateway Church for a reason. There's a reason you are all here. See, I believe that God wants to do something incredible. I believe that God wants to spark a genuine revival of souls in this entire region. And I believe that God wants to use us as a tool to do it. But let me tell you something, it will not happen and we will not hear the voice of God and be able to accomplish His will unless we are being led by His Spirit, unless we are hearing His voice. So if you are serious about wanting to see God move in our midst, if you are serious about wanting to see this assembly be in the divine will of God, then I'm going to ask you to join me in a fast. This fast is going to start every Tuesday night at 8 o'clock and is going to finish every Wednesday night at 8 o'clock. The fast will not stop until God tells us to stop. The reason we're starting on Tuesday night at 8 and finishing Wednesday night at 8 is because Bible study is at 7 o'clock on Wednesday night. 
We are going to finish every fast by studying the word of God and praying. There is a purpose for this fast. We are praying for three specific things in this fast. We are praying for God's guidance, for God's power, and for God's favor. Say this with me. God's guidance, God's power, and God's favor. This is what we are praying for because we will not see God's will accomplished. We will not see uh, God's will being done in our midst unless it is being done through God's guidance, through God's power, and through God's favor. We can't do this on our own. We've tried long enough. We've tried long enough and it didn't work. So now we turn to God. We, get, we seek His favor. We seek His guidance. We seek His power. So I'm going to ask you if you will join me in that fast. So if I could have every head bowed and every eye closed, I'm going to ask you to take a step of faith right now. No one else is looking, but God is. God is going to see what you're about to do. If you are willing to join me in this fast and seek God, I want you to raise a hand where you're at and say, I will do it. I see those hands. I see those hands. I see that hand. You're not promising yourself. You're not promising me. You have just promised God. You've just promised God that you will make this commitment. The Bible says that if you make that commitment, which you just did, and if you will honor that commitment, we will be rewarded. We will hear the voice of God. We will see God move in our midst. We will see the power of God. We will see the favor of God. Lord Jesus, we have made a declaration here this morning as a church. Lord, no more fun and games. God, we are making a commitment and we are standing here today before you saying we are going to begin a fast. We are going to begin to earnestly seek your voice. Lord, we desire to hear your voice. We desire to see your power. We desire to see your will, not ours, your will accomplished. Lord, we desire more than anything to be in your divine will. And I pray, oh God, that you would begin to speak to every last one of us who has raised our hands, who said that we are willing to make this sacrifice for you. Lord Jesus, we desire to hear you. We ask you, oh God, in your name, in your holy, wonderful name of Jesus, to speak. We pray it in your name, amen.